Good afternoon. Our new series is on people that met the Lord Jesus and what they gained and lost through that meeting. And today we're going to talk about some of the disciples. We've titled this Leaving All to Follow Jesus. I'm going to read to you from Mark 1. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. This is the area of Israel that we are talking about in this series of lessons. And last week we talked about how people came to hear John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, the, the person who was going to speak of the Messiah and tell everyone that he was coming. Do you remember we said that they didn't have messages and emails and things that could go out um, and no one quite knew exactly when things were going to happen. So a messenger would be sent ahead to say, someone is coming. And that's what John did for the Messiah, for Christ. And you can see there that there's an arrow pointing to a dot just above Jerusalem, just above the Dead Sea, which shows where John the Baptist was speaking. And as we heard last week, Jesus came while the crowds were there listening to him and he was baptised in the River Jordan. And as we just read, after John was uh, uh, imprisoned, after he was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee. So he would have walked uh, probably up the river there. You can see that if he keeps walking about, uh, along the River Jordan, he would get to the Sea of Galilee, which is smaller than the Dead Sea um, and up a little bit further there. Not quite as far as uh, Caesarea Philippi or Capernaum, but close enough. And along the way, he wouldn't have just um, walked solitary, not speaking to anybody. He spoke to people. He, he told his message. When he was baptised, that was the start of Jesus' earthly ministry. And from that point on, he told people what he had come to say. He gave them his message. And by the time he got to Galilee, the message would have got there ahead of him. He was uh, he came to Galilee, as we said, he called to some of the disciples and some fishermen while he was there. So the focus today is this little area here. Now, as I said, Jesus would have walked along the River Jordan here up to the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee was not a place which was calm and quiet it was a rough sea. It was a sea that went from being very quiet to being very rough very quickly. And these fishermen, they weren't uh, weak, mild men. You, you see pictures, don't you, of the bright skies and people out in their boats and having a nice time. But these men would have to be strong, hard men. They were out on that sea in all weathers and they would have to pull in those heavy nets full of fish. Now we'd have machines to do that, wouldn't we? But they would have had to do it all by hand and it was hard work. So these were not soft men. These were not men who just um, potted around, not doing very much and had a lot of time on their hands. They worked hard. This was a hard, tough job. But they had heard the message that Jesus told and they had listened to it. We know this because if, if otherwise, if someone had just walked up to them and said, leave your families, leave everything and, and come and follow me, we'd say no, wouldn't we? You'd need to know who that person was before you went. And they knew that this was Jesus. They knew that this was the Messiah. 
and they chose to follow him. We're going to compare the things that they left behind here with the things that they gained. Um, and But just to relate slightly what, what happened there, Jesus went to one part of uh, the Sea of Galilee and there he told uh, Simon and his brother Andrew to come and they did. And he went to another part and James and John came also. They all left their families. They left what they were doing immediately and they came and followed Jesus. And he took them as he preached around the Sea of Galilee, as he went all over Israel, spreading his message. So we read here uh, how he um, met Simon and Andrew. A little later, we read about James and John, didn't we? And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will be make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Do you know, it struck me while I was reading this that there's no mention there of them having even collected in their nets. In the next part, we hear that they were fixing the nets, but here they were casting a net into the sea. They were putting that net in, ready to catch some fish. But they immediately left their nets. Now, that certainly sounds like they didn't even draw in the fish that they'd gone to all of that effort to collect. They left everything. They left their boat, they left their nets, and they went. Even all of those fish. Those fish were what earned them their money. Without those fish, how would they pay their way? But they left them anyway. So they left their nets, they left their jobs, they left their livelihoods. They also left their security. Now, by that, I don't even mean the money that I've just mentioned to you that they left behind. These were Jewish people and they would have gone to the synagogue and worshipped there and heard there about the Messiah that was coming. But when they left with Jesus, they went into the synagogue with him and he taught that doesn't sound particularly significant until you think about what he was teaching. Jesus wasn't teaching the same as what was being said at the synagogue. He came and he spoke a message that the Pharisees and the leaders there wouldn't have liked. And we know they didn't like because it says that in the Bible in numerous passages. And Simon and Andrew, they went with him and James and John by this point as well. They went to the synagogue and they listened to him teaching about something that wasn't the same as what they'd been hearing. Now, I say it wasn't the same. Of course, in some ways it was. They were still hearing about how to become a Christian, but the Jewish teachings had changed a lot by this point. And there was a lot of a focus in those synagogues on doing the right thing on doing the sacrifices that were needed, on praying and waiting for the Messiah. And yet, when that Messiah came, a lot of Jewish people didn't recognise him. They didn't know the scriptures well enough, perhaps, or they just weren't willing to know that this was the Messiah. And so, in some ways, this message, while it was the same as what they should have been being taught. In some ways, it was entirely different. And as I said, the Pharisees didn't like it. The leaders of the church didn't like it. And so they would have been against these fishermen who were following Jesus. So they went from being normal people who worked on their boats, fishing, perhaps they were well thought of in their villages, perhaps they looked after their families to suddenly being people that followed the one that was against everything everyone knew, was changing everything. They also left their families. Now, this is the passage here where James and John went with Jesus. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. 
and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So they left their families. In fact, we read in another passage of, uh, of Mark or Luke that um, Simon had a wife. And we know this because Simon's wife's mother was ill and Jesus um, healed her. So Simon even left his wife so that he could follow Jesus. They left their families and they didn't even go and speak to them first. At least Ebedee here would have known immediately where James and John were. Perhaps he believed also, and so he let them go, and he didn't complain, he didn't say anything. But in other cases, the people around would have had to go and tell the families what had happened. I would hope that those families were supportive and were understanding too, that they had heard the message of Jesus and they wanted them to go and be with him and support him and tell others of the Messiah who had come. But they had to leave their families behind to do so. In fact, they left everything. Their whole lives changed. They left their homes, they left their jobs, they left their families. They were people who simply followed. They didn't know where they were going. They hadn't been told we're going to take this route and we're going to go there. At this stage, they didn't really even know what they were being called to do. They knew that they were to be fishers of men, but they didn't really know what that meant. We know now, don't we, in hindsight, that what they were doing was preaching to people and telling them the message that Jesus had brought, that uh, he was the saviour, that people needed to come to him and have their sins forgiven, just as they had. But we read here that Peter began to say, Peter is Simon, but his name was changed, wasn't it? Then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Now, Peter says this almost as, a, as an argument against Christ when he's explaining something. But it, it tells us something there that Peter is saying, we have left everything. We haven't kept anything with us. We haven't uh, brought out our wives and our children along with us. We've left everything and we followed you, not knowing where we were going. We also read uh, in Luke 9 that Jesus didn't have anywhere to lay his head. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. Now, in this case, the person that he asks to follow refuses. They go back, they, they say they've got family to look after and things to do, and, and they refuse to follow him. Perhaps they refused because of what he'd said before about not having anywhere to call his own. He didn't have a home. He didn't have somewhere to go to and recuperate and be alone where no one else would interrupt. In fact, we read in several places where Jesus uh, went to a lonely place, to a secluded place, to have some time alone, and yet he was followed by the crowds because they wanted to hear more of what he said. So he had nowhere to lay his head, nowhere to call his own. And those fishermen cho chose to do the same. They chose to follow him and to leave everything. Now that sounds like I'm saying that leaving Christ, leaving everything behind, was a negative thing for them, but it wasn't at all. It may have felt like it at the time. It may have felt like they weren't really sure quite what they were doing. Do you know, sometimes when you move house, you think, is this the right thing to do? Am I going to regret this? Is this really the right thing? But we don't hear of the disciples having any doubts like that, do we? We don't hear of thoughts going through their heads about whether they should have just stayed where they were and been content. They followed Jesus, not just a friend, not just uh, someone who was saying, come this way and come and join us. But the Lord Jesus, God come to earth in human form and they got to spend time with him and to walk around with him and to learn directly from him. 
we are so privileged to hear those words in the Bible, aren't we? We're so privileged to read what so many generations of Christians before us have not been able to read. And they were privileged because they got to hear it all directly from Jesus. And yet, even though they heard it directly and others did also, he wasn't recognised by everybody when he was here. Such an intriguing thought, isn't it? That we could hear those amazing words of Christ and not recognise him. So they left everything behind. They left their families, their nets, their jobs, their livelihoods, even the, the religion that they'd been brought up in and known was uh, changed to the right way. None of, no, none of the works religion anymore, nothing about what they needed to do, but simply trusting in Christ. And yet, for all that they lost, they gained so much more. They left their nets behind, they left their jobs, their nets, their, their, their boats, everything that they had, their ways of getting money. But they got a new purpose. So many of us go through life working, trying to get money, perhaps trying to be happy, trying to have families. And nothing goes quite how we want it to because that's life. Nothing is ever perfect. But once you are converted, you have a new purpose in life. Your purpose is not money and just looking after your families and just working, as important as those things are, of course. But there is a new purpose, a new reason for living. And that reason is to spread Jesus's words to everybody, because that is more important than any job. So they got a new purpose. They left behind, as I said, the religion and uh, all the things that they'd known in terms of uh, being Jewish and what that meant. But they got a new security, a new religion, a new, uh, a new surety of what was going to happen. As a, a Jewish person, they believed that they needed to keep following the sacrifices, keep asking for forgiveness for their sins repeatedly through these sacrifices. But... As a Christian, we know that Christ has forgiven us. We know we have an assurance that when we die, we will go and be with him. We have that purpose and that, that uh, future ahead of us. And it's, it's a joyful, amazing thing to know that whatever happens here and whatever this life is like, the future will be perfect because it will be with our saviour. They left behind their families, as I said, even wives, even children, but they got a new family, the family of Christ's people. All the people of Christ are uh, like a family because we love each other as we are commanded to, but also as is just in us, we just can't help it. It's part of being one of God's people that we love other people who are also Christ's and we know that they will be with us and help us that they will pray for us and more importantly we have a new father we have Christ we have the father in heaven and they are our family too and we can pray to them and spend time with them and spend time with the words of the bible we have a new family so they left everything or it felt like they did, and yet they gained everything. They gained a completely new life. All these things that they thought were what they needed and what they wanted, they heard what Christ said, and they realised that they were nothing, that all of those things that they had, as good as they were, they were nothing compared to what Christ could give them. And we know this too. Yes, we give up those sins that hurt us, those things that we do that hurt Christ and are against him. But we gain so much more. Do you know, some people think before they're converted that being one of God's people is, is like being in chains because there's rules, because there's things to follow. But 
those rules, they're your freedom. You, in Christ, you are, you're free from sin. You're free from the hurt and the pain that this life can bring because you know that you can look forward to something far, far better. In, in Second Peter, uh, these words were written by Peter to one of the churches and it says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That means that Christ took them from all the things that they had known and that they had wanted. He gave them great and precious promises, such as the promise of forgiveness and eternal life. He helped them to escape from the sin. That's where it says the corruption in this world. All the things that go wrong in this world, they escaped from and they became part of the divine nature. One with God. We get to be with him forever in heaven. So for all those things that they lost, they never regretted it. They never looked back and thought we shouldn't have done that because they gained so much more. And that's what I'd like you to think about this week. I'd like you to weigh up those gains and those losses. For me, when I did this, the gains in coming to my saviour and spending time with him were so much greater. And every true Christian will tell you the same, that you gain so much more through Christ than you could ever have in this world. But as much as I tell you that, I know that not everyone will believe me and not everyone be will believe the words of God. But I hope that you will think about it for yourself and that you will come to a real realisation of what that truly means. I'd just like to finish by reading this last verse here about weighing up those things and then we'll pray together. It says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus for my, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. I don't just suffer the loss. I gladly give them away and count them as rubbish so that I can have my saviour who died for me on that cross of Calvary to take away my sins, to take away my punishment forever. Let's pray. Dear Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, pray to you and thank you, O Lord, for this message that you have given, for this opportunity to see what true followers of you have done and to think on these things, Lord. You told them the message, the Holy Spirit worked in their hearts and they spent the rest of their lives and the rest of eternity will be spent with you, Lord. And we praise and thank you that the same can be said of us. Lord, we thank you that we do not have to keep making sacrifices of animals like had to be done in the Old Testament. We thank you that that true sacrifice, that uh, everlasting sacrifice of your son on the cross is enough and more than enough to cover my sin and my punishment, Lord, and the punishment and the sin of all those who truly believe and come to you. And Lord, we pray that all those who are already yours, Lord, who are listening to this, would be encouraged by your words, by the things that you have promised us and said to us. And Lord, most of all, I pray for those who do not already know you, those who have not weighed up the things that they would gain through being with you, Lord. And I pray and ask you to truly do this. Help them to truly understand and come to you, Lord, that they would trust in you for all things and believe what you did on that cross 
was for them, Lord, and to give their lives to thee also, just as those disciples did. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.